So it's official, we are in a friendship recession. And these aren't just my words. Last year, the US Surgeon General's office, the highest medical office in the United States, published a report describing loneliness as an epidemic, likening its effect on mortality to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Other researchers have also written about loneliness and described it as a risk factor for stroke, heart disease, and early death. In the US, the number of adults without any close friends has increased fivefold in the last 30 years. And while young adults are the most likely to be affected, loneliness is at record highs across age and geography. And some of you might not be too surprised to hear that, whether it's from personal experience or just from keeping up with the news in this space. But I think there's more to the story than is usually reported. Trying to investigate loneliness typically leads you down one of two paths. The first tries to give you quick fixes hacks that you can use to solve the problem supposedly overnight. And the other is slightly more validating, but also dangerous, and presents you an echo chamber of people who feel the same way and tell you that things are never gonna get better. And that's not too surprising to me. Loneliness is a big problem to tackle. It's one that's puzzled philosophers, psychologists, and politicians, but it does have some pretty serious implications across the whole of our lives. And so I think it's worth asking ourselves when we hear about this loneliness epidemic, is this just the normal part of the human experience or is there something deeper going on? So I recently got thinking about this because I just moved about 3000 miles away from home and I've kind of been forced to relearn the art of making friends. And let me tell you, as a mid twenties introvert whose main hobbies are making internet videos and baking bread, it's not that easy. And I'm well aware that I'm very much not alone in this struggle. In fact, part of the challenge is the fact that I'm not overly lonely right now. But the thing about socializing is it's best done when you feel kind of okay about yourself. And in fact, it's worth taking some time to maybe clarify a few definitions, particularly the difference between solitude and loneliness. Solitude is just the physical state of being alone. In fact, I generally quite enjoy being alone. Even when I am closer to my friends and family, I spend, you know, most of my time alone by choice. Loneliness is different, however, and I would maybe invite you to take a second to think about how you would define loneliness. But I'm going to give you a definition that I think resonates quite a lot with me, and maybe you'll be able to relate with it. Okay, so I think loneliness can best be defined as a gap. A gap between the total amount of connection a person desires and the total amount of connection they actually have in their life. This can look different for different people. Some people will fill their plate with lots of small regular interactions, while other people will have a few maybe more meaningful relationships in their life. However, one thing's true, over time a lack of connection will lead you to eventually feel lonely. There's one thing that this kind of definition gets at that I think is a bit more meaningful to me. And really it's the idea that loneliness isn't about necessarily the frequency of social interactions, nor is it about the size of your immediate social group. In fact, there's this one quote from a Robin Williams movie that I think really gets to the idea quite well. Um, let me give it to you. It goes something along the lines of, I used to think the worst thing in life was to end up all alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people that make you feel alone. What we're seeing more and more frequently is that people's desired level of connection is just not being met. And I think there are a few reasons why this is the case. It is worth us at least understanding why people are so lonely, and maybe we might be able to develop some actionable steps that can help us towards solving the problem. And I think it's obviously worth starting with the elephant in the room, technology. So before we go any further, I just want to take a second to thank Shortform, who've kindly sponsored part of this video. Shortform serves as my starting point when I begin researching these videos. They have these really accessible abridged versions of books that you can read in either a written form or audio form. They also have tons of articles. For example, when I began the research for this video, I read an article by Donald Hall, an author and poet who described at length his experience of loneliness throughout his 80s. Shortform's version of this served as a great starting point, giving me references and links to other sources that I could use to further dive deep into the research. They have tons of interest in books and articles that cover things like philosophy, psychology, and science, to name a few. And their library is updated weekly, so there really is something for everyone. It's a service that's helped me a fair amount in my personal and professional life, 
And I just think it's a neat way to stay educated, regardless of what you're interested in. You get a free trial and 20% off an annual subscription. Join Shortform through my special link, shortform.com slash fads, or click the link in the description. Thank you once again to Shortform for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. Now, wait, 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 okay. I don't want this to just be like another video, which is just like social media companies are bad because of everything they've done to divide us politically and socially and all of that stuff, right? No matter how true that may be. But I think that we can be a little bit short-sighted when we talk about loneliness and we focus just on social media because the focus on social media suggests to me that before, say, Facebook launched in 2004, everybody was doing fine. And yet, the data seems to suggest that loneliness has been a problem for much longer than that. So we're obviously missing something. It's not surprising that most of the discourse around this tends to focus on recent years. Because, well, humans in general have a recency bias. We tend to think that things that have happened within our lifetimes and within our recent life is more important than anything else that's happened before. But it's also fair enough because, you know, a lot has happened in recent years. But in our effort to get a fuller picture of what's going on, I want to maybe turn the clock back a little further to a period that doesn't get discussed quite as much. The 1950s. Now, you might think it's a bit weird for me to go this far back in history, but I promise it is, it is all linked together. Just follow me for this one, okay? You see, the 1950s gave us a lot. It gave us microchips, it gave us passenger jets, and it gave us everybody's favourite generation, the baby boomers. Now, while the boomers were busy being children, their parents had a pretty big job on their hands during the 1950s. I don't know if you heard about it, but there was a few minor disagreements in the years leading up to the 1950s. And so it was time to rebuild. And rebuild they did. New neighbourhoods, new cities and whole new developments across the Western world. With this newfound economic prosperity during the 1950s, lots and lots of new technology began to appear. And one piece of technology was especially dominant. It went from being present in just 8% of households in America in 1950 to being present in almost 90 by the end of the decade. This piece of technology was, well, actually, you know, any guesses? What do you think it is? What do you think it is? Ah, it's the TV. Television, right? So television completely dominated the 50s. And it was pretty pivotal, actually, I think, to kind of explain in where this loneliness epidemic has come from. Today, when most of us think of television, we think of it as a genre rather than as a piece of technology. I feel like it can be quite difficult to grasp quite how revolutionary the television was back then. There are writers who have described the television as being more important to how we spend our leisure time than the invention of the automobile, like literally more important than cars, which is insane. But that just goes to show like the scale of development that the television represented. But TV's quest for popularity had not been without victims. The cinema and theatre industries in particular had had pretty severe drops in attendance throughout this decade. And along with these drops in attendance came a loss of socialisation. People were driven to spend more and more time inside their 1950s homes in 1950s suburbia, freshly built and brand new. It just happened to be that these places in which they were living seemed to be almost designed to produce the maximum amount of isolation and individualism. The effect of the TV, I think, is just one symptom of a much broader change during this period. A kind of mass movement of people from dense urban centres into sparse suburbia. People were now expected to get into their brand new 1950s car and drive for several miles for any kind of social event. Spaces like cinemas and theatres had served in the decades leading up to the 1950s, not just as entertainment venues. They were community hubs where people could socialise at relatively low cost. For example, a cinema ticket in the 50s could be as cheap as 25 cents. And in the early days of cinema, you didn't even have like timetables, right? You would just turn up, sit down and wait for the movie to end and start again. <laughs> It was a very casual affair. If we contrast that to how it feels to attend a cinema today, you almost feel like they're desperate to get you in and out as quickly as possible. Spaces like cinemas and theatres were often independently owned and served as third places, a term used to describe places where you can socialise outside of work and your home, but do so at a relatively low cost. Spaces like this were essential for casual socialisation, the kind of socialisation that even today most of us still do with our friends. 
But this mass migration during the 1950s from urban areas into suburbia represented a huge shift. It made these third spaces more and more inaccessible and provided alternatives that were relatively affordable and a lot more convenient to use, such as television. It's not too surprising to see how people could get lonely when their neighborhood looks like the back rooms, right? Suburbia has none of the benefits of truly rural living where you can, you know, reconnect with nature in a meaningful way. But it also doesn't have any of the benefits of urban living where you're surrounded by people effectively. It's kind of the worst of both worlds. And so it's not too surprising that even today, people living in suburbs have the highest risk of depression compared to people living in truly rural areas or people living in urban centers. But I'm gonna put my urbanist propaganda aside for a second, because it doesn't feel like people living in cities are doing particularly well on the loneliness front today. And I can vouch for that as someone who's lived pretty much exclusively in cities for the last five or so years. But why is that? Well, I think it all comes down to the same thing, really. Those living in urban centers are seeing the loss of third places, the loss of libraries, the loss of cafes, the loss of local businesses that offer this kind of casual socialization. And the statistics seem to support that with fewer and fewer people saying that they have a place that they would consider a third place, even in the last few years. What we get when this happens at scale is that people are more and more restricted to two places, home and work. And so when we seek an alternative, a way to entertain ourselves, a way to relax, we reach for the next best alternative, right? Which for most of us is technology. Our phones, our laptops, our TVs, they've become a kind of virtual third place where we can escape and have a way to feel like we're not in work mode. And some parts of the world have gotten off a bit easier. They still have dense living, they still have a sense of local community. But no matter where you are, I'd be surprised if you haven't felt that feeling somewhat erode in the last few years. All of this is to say that loneliness is a recent problem, but it's also in quite a few ways just not a recent problem. It's something that's been building up, steadily boiling under the surface for a number of decades now. And it'll be a little surprise to you that people who don't have a third space are generally more distrustful of their community. They feel less safe and they're less optimistic about the future of their community because they don't feel like there's a sense of cohesion or of belonging. And I think we should be seriously concerned about this. Now, I'm not the first person to talk about loneliness in this way. In fact, let me introduce you to Hannah Arendt. Arendt was a political theorist and philosopher who wrote primarily about the development of totalitarian governments. She lived through them herself and was on the run for a significant period of her life. She also wrote a lot about loneliness and she thought that loneliness was a, an essential part of explaining how these governments came to take over the mind of the common masses. In her own words, she said, what prepares men for totalitarian domination in the non-totalitarian world is the fact that loneliness, once a borderline experience suffered in certain marginal social conditions like old age, has become an everyday experience. In Aaron's view, loneliness wasn't just something we experienced anymore. It was something that could be weaponized and used against us. The lonely individual would end up losing all relationship with reality and be really susceptible to taking on the false reality proposed by tyrants. Under this view, loneliness becomes much more than just a transient state. It's an organized process to disrupt our shared reality, the reality that we have with each other, and render us unable to make proper judgments and proper assessments about the state of the world. It would turn people into a great unorganized, structureless mass of furious individuals who have nothing in common except their vague apprehension that the most respected, articulate and representative members of the community were fools and that all the powers that be were equally stupid and fraudulent. This kind of person loses faith not only in other people but in reality. In Arendt's words, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the dedicated communist, but the people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction true and false no longer exist. And without being melodramatic, it feels like the world that Arendt describes is present on full display today. The role of social media in fueling extremism and loneliness is pretty well documented. And while obviously we can't make 
a one-to-one comparison between someone who lived through Nazi Germany and the landscape today. I think it says a lot that it very much feels like Arendt's words could have been written in 2024. I think Arendt does a really good job of capturing a specific feeling that arises when you've been really lonely for a long time. This feeling that everybody else is living in kind of a parallel reality to yours, that they couldn't possibly understand what you're going through, and that any advice that's given is just kind of not sensible. It doesn't come from a place of understanding and of being able to empathize with the way you feel. You feel like a like an outsider. And it's that path that can lead to complete alienation, right? A complete sense of dissociation from the rest of the world and a feeling that you don't belong. But admittedly, it's not an exhaustive description of loneliness because, you know, not everyone who's lonely becomes a radical extremist. Some people just try to cope. So I want to briefly chat about monk mode. If you haven't heard of monk mode before, it's basically the idea that if you have any life goals, you should willingly withdraw for a few months from participating in society, basically, to just grind and hustle towards those goals. And then you can return back to society and now be like an absolute chad. It's like a real life version of the hyperbolic time chamber from Dragon Ball Z. And while hustle bros are a savvy common feature on this channel, I feel like I talk about them a bit too much. This is a little different because it didn't evoke the usual feelings of mild to moderate cringe. Instead, I felt really sad when I took a kind of look into these communities because feelings of loneliness become so apparent to me as an outsider. And it becomes quite obvious when you read the ways in which they describe how monk mode should effectively work. For example, one user says, self-growth does not come from being surrounded by loved ones. And another says, when you start living differently from the masses, it makes everyone uncomfortable. And when I read comments like these, to me, this just screams like an effort to beat the lack of connection that we have. An effort to turn the lack of connection that many of us often feel into a feature of the system rather than a bug. And who can really blame them, right? It's it's a hard problem to solve as we've established and they're just trying their best to find a solution. I just don't necessarily think that this is the healthiest one. I think it's possible to grow as a person when you are surrounded by loved ones and personally I feel like that's when I've made the greatest development rather than withdraw and you know grind 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 and then come back as a better person somehow. Loneliness is special in a way, I think, to me, because it really feels like one of those problems that, like, we can we can do something about, you know? Like, it's, it's quite easy to feel powerless against the cost of living crisis or against climate change. But loneliness seems like one that we should be able to, like, make tangible progress towards solving, even as individuals. And so I went back to this report that I mentioned at the start by the US Surgeon General's office and took notes. And I also took notes about my own experience of loneliness when I felt the most lonely and when I've also felt the least lonely and the greatest sense of belonging. And there was kind of a common thread that ran through all of this. The Surgeon General's report offered some good suggestions, such as spending less time in front of a screen, for one, as well as using less social media and learning to practice gratitude. However, there was one point that appeared both in the report and in my own notes and I think this was really the biggest factor for me whenever I felt the least lonely. This has been the biggest feature that's been in my life that's helped me deal with loneliness. And it's being of service to people. But what does that mean in practice, right? To me, being of service to people can manifest in a ton of different ways. It can be something that you make a formal part of your day-to-day -day life, right? Such as volunteering or taking part in a community project. But it can also be something a lot more casual. It can be cooking dinner for a parent or a friend, helping someone move, or it can be something as simple as playing a game of football at the park and feeling like you're being of service to a team. What being of service isn't is people-pleasing. People-pleasing is different to me. I think people-pleasing is when you sacrifice your own happiness in order to make someone else happy, whereas being of service isn't a zero-sum game. The other person wins and you win. It increases the total amount of happiness in the world, right? 
And I'm sure like no matter who you are on this planet, there is a way for you to be of service to another person and you'll both reap the rewards of that. And in general, I would encourage you to think about how you can be of service if loneliness is something that you struggle with. But more importantly, I would like to tell you that you should also just be patient with yourself, right? You're not going to be able to watch one video and suddenly be like, oh, I'm not lonely anymore. I fixed it. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience and it's going to take compassion, compassion for other people, but also compassion for yourself. And I think that's probably everything I have to say. Um, yeah, I hope some of that could be helpful or educational to you. And I'm going to wish you a lovely day. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.